Well, thank you for joining us today again. And this is the second session of the webinar entitled Remote Sensing of Coastal Ecosystems. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and similarly to last week and next week, I'll be joined by my colleague Amber McCollum from the NASA Ames Research Center. As a reminder, this webinar consists of three one-hour sessions that will be uh, given on August 25th, so last week, September 1st and September 8th. And remember that the same content, content is presented in two different times a day at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Time US. But the morning session is in English and the afternoon session is in Spanish. And you only need to sign up for one of the, each of the sessions on each day. Also, you can access all the course materials at the web page shown on the screen here. And this includes the PowerPoint presentations and a homework assignment, which will be available on the last day of the webinar series. And remember that during the course of, uh, of this session, you feel free to add your questions to the live chat at any time. But you can also submit your questions to either myself or Amber McCollum to the emails that are shown on the screen. There's one homework assignment to complete this course, which will need to be submitted via Google Forms. As with most RCEP courses, the homework will not become available on, on the course website until the last day. So it will become available on September 8th. And also remember that to obtain the certificate of completion, you need to attend the live webinars and to submit the assignment on or before September 22nd, which is two weeks after the end of this webinar series. Keep in mind that because of the high volume of participants attending these webinars, it takes approximately two months to receive the certificates. Now, like I said last week, this is an introductory course, but we recommend the, to, uh, for you to take the fundamentals of remote sensing course or to have an equivalent ex experience as a prerequisite. Again, all the course materials are available on the course website shown here on the screen. Last week, we presented an overview of major tropical and temperate coastal ecosystems and also talk about some satellite sensors typically used for analyzing these ecosystems. Today, we're going to talk about water quality and how the light regime is affected depending on the concentration of different constituents in the water column. We will also put all this information in the context of retrieving benthic information from a relatively clear, clear water site, a coral reef in the Caribbean. And then during the last uh, last week, uh, week and next week, we will then present an overview of shorelines and how remote sensing and in situ techniques can be complemented for the mapping and analysis of those shorelines. So here are the learning, learning objectives for this particular session. By the end of this session, you're going to be available to identify the main optical properties of the water column and how these affect the remote sensing signal from the bentos. In particular, we'll talk about inherent and apparent optical properties of the water column. And you'll need, you will then be able to distinguish some of the typical field measurements necessary for the validation and calibration of ocean coral data. And then towards the end, you will identify differences in the signal of main benthic components of a coral reef once the image is processed for water column correction. OK, so let's start. Uh, let's talk first about different requirements for coastal water quality remote sensing. Aquatic remote sensing, particularly in coastal areas, is challenging. In order to accurately assess water quality parameters, fine scale data is needed as many watersheds and bays have relatively small size of several kilometers wide or long, and course data does not provide an adequate resolution. Now, this is the case of many temperate and tropical islands, as well as other sites on the continental scale. Ideally, 
for coastal remote sensing, spatial scales of tens to a few hundred meters can provide enough detail to assess changes in water quality over time. Such resolutions also provide for the definition of major benthic categories in shallow water ecosystems, particularly in clear waters. As we saw last week, highly heterogeneous ecosystems like coral reefs or kelp forests may contain a number of different benthic components uh, within any given pixel. And similarly, low spatial resolution may hinder adequate characterization of river plumes or other parameters within small embayments as the pixel signal, uh, the pixel signal may be influenced by edge effects from the nearby lands. Unfortunately, many sensors typically used uh, for water color an analysis, such as MODIS or SeaWeave, have a relatively coarse spatial resolution on the order of hundreds of, uh, of meters to kilometers. Now, the ocean science community has been working hard to develop indices with higher resolution imagery, such as that of Landsat or Sentinel. Now, in terms of uh, temporal resolution, due to its liquid nature and, and as a result of ocean currents and wave action, the composition of ocean and coastal dissolved and suspended matter is changing almost on a constant basis. Therefore, ocean phenomena may vary in a matter of hours or even minutes. And this brings the importance of being able to collect in situ data as close as possible to the overpass of the particular satellite that we're using. In other words, depending on the phenomena we're studying, it may happen that the water mass that was at one site during the satellite overpass might not be the same as the one where the in-situ data was collected, if there's more than several hours of difference between both collection times. The image on the top right here shows a river plume in the Guanica uh, Bay in southwest Puerto Rico during a big rainfall event in 2014. As we'll see in the next slide, the plume had almost completely moved to the west a few days after the event. Now, as we saw last week, many benthic and water column components are photosynthetic and have very similar pigments. Hence, multispectral imagery can only allow for the characterization of major components like chlorophyll A, for example. There's been a number of indices like the fluorine algal index for detecting sargassum, uh, the brown seaweed, and similar algae types. And there's an index that was developed uh, by a professor of uh, CSUMB, Dr. Sherry Palacios, called Phytotax, uh, for, particularly for uh, analyzing phyto, phytoplankton functional types. Now, coastal waters are very complex and require even higher spatial resolution to be able to spectrally separate the signals from particular parameters, which may absorb or, re or reflect in similar parts of the spectrum. The image, shown on the bottom uh, right here, shows a sargassum event in the shores of Southwest Puerto Rico and ex its extension. Here, we see how uh, instruments with uh, totally different spatial resolutions can be combined to study a particular event. This shows the movement of the river plume that I mentioned in the previous slide from its origin on the right-hand side, the right-hand image here from Landsat 8, collected on November 12, and how far the plume has extended towards the west in just one day after, <clears throat> just one day after, in an overimposing, uh, already analyzed image of beers. Now, you see that despite the difference in spatial resolutions, the advantage of having BIRS imagery on a basically pretty much on a daily basis allowed for the researchers at the University of Puerto Rico, the Bioptical Oceanography Lab, to track the river plume moving over the nearby reef platform of the La Palguera in southwest Puerto Rico. This could not have been made possible with two consecutive Landsat images, for example, since the revisit time of Landsat is 16 days. So we would have lost all the movement of the of the river boom with by comparing two different landsat images. 
This comparison of these two uh, images shown on the screen also show the limitations with coarse pixels images, such as in the case of BIRS, which is not able to show fine grain details happening either close uh, to the coastal zone or in between the reefs uh, located in this platform. Therefore, there's a trade-off between temporal and spatial resolutions between both sensors. Okay, there might be some of you in the audience who are divers. And when you're diving underwater, particularly if you're diving and, and in deep areas, have you ever seen how blood looks like in those uh, depths? It actually looks dark green. It doesn't look red. And here's a reason why. The penetration of light in the water column is wavelength, wavelength dependent. This affects the availability of certain wavelengths at, at depths. Longer wavelengths, just as, such as the reds, are absorbed within the first few meters of water. And therefore, in coastal areas, very little red is still available to interact with matter at 20 meters depth. Also, in coastal waters, due to the absorption of different constituents, which we'll discuss in the next few slides, most of the shorter wavelengths, the violets and the blues, are also absorbed within the first tens of meters. This, and the scattering caused by uh, suspended particles, is what causes the variations in colors that we see in coastal areas, mostly from green to brownish. In the open ocean, well the, con con the, well, the concentration of these constituents is much lower, or sometimes even negligible, short wavelengths can penetrate up to several hundred meters of water. This is what we see in this graph in the, in the far uh, left. Now, the figure on the right shows how light interacts with both atmospheric and underwater particles or constituents. Light is scattered and absorbed by the atmosphere. And in fact, about 80% of the signal received by the sensor of any given satellite is related to the atmosphere. The rest contains information about the water column and possibly depending on how clear or turbid the water is, the bottom or the sea floor. Some of the light is reflected uh, by the sea surface and the transmitted portion interacts with water constituents. Visible light leaves the water surface and is detected by the sensor only after it is absorbed even more or scattered even more by the atmosphere. So you see the, the big component of the atmosphere in the signal that is actually received by a satellite. Now, what does the color of the water tell us actually? The color of water gives us information about the different constituents either dissolved or suspended in the medium. On the top left figure, on the top left photo here, you see a typical photo of oceanic waters, or at the very least, uh, waters outside the continental or insular shelves. And these are oligotrophic waters, which means that they're waters with a very small concentration of nutrients. The photo on the top right is a typical photo of the coastal zone where you can see the influence of phytoplankton, the phytoplankton community, as it is reflected by the green color from the chlorophylls. The photo on the bottom, on the bottom left shows an area directly uh, into a river mouth right after a rain event, and it shows the high concentration of sediments here. And the photo of the bottom right uh, also reflects the influence of a particular type of phytoplankton community. In this case, this is a bloom of a toxic dinoflagellate called Coclodinium polycricoides inside a bioluminescent bay in southwest Puerto Rico. The redness of the water reflects the pigment composition of this particular dinoflagellate. Uh, this, could be, and this could be considered uh, a red type. Also, the term, although the term red tide is a, is a genetic one. The correct term is halfum algal blooms. And in this case, there's also the influence of tannins that are released from the red mangrove roots that surround the bay, which you might have seen the reflection of some of them here in the photo. Okay, 
We're going to go over some instrumentation for collecting in situ data on a number of uh, water parameters in a moment. But as we discussed last week, uh, usually some of the most important parameters for water quality assessment include uh, measuring the concentration of, uh, for instance, suspended materials in, uh, such as chlorophyll A, which can be used to estimate primary production in the water column, total suspended sediments or total suspended matter, which provides information on the origin of sediments, whether they are land-based or they are produced in situ, and color dissolved organic matter, which originates from the decomposition of uh, organic material. Each of these constituents absorb light uh, particular wavelengths and can help in the interpretation of a remotely sensed signal. In the figure here, you see how sediments strongly absorb in the, in the yellow and the red region of the spectrum, whereas uh, chlorophyll reflects in the green, for example. We're going to discuss inherent and apparent optical properties in the next slide. Here's a short discussion about uh, the differences between inherent and apparent optical, optical properties. The, the inherent optical properties depend only upon the medium and they are independent of the ambient light field. Usually these are easily defined, but they can be exceptionally difficult uh, to measure, and particularly in the field. And Typical uh, IOPs on inherent optical, optical, optical properties include absorption and scattering. Now, apparent optical properties, they depend both on the medium and on the geometric structure of the ambient, ambient light field. But they, they, they display enough regular features and stability that can be used as descriptors to the water body. So this is an advantage of using apparent optical properties. And generally, they are much easier uh, to measure, but they are difficult to inter interpret because of how the environment affects them. Typical uh, AOPs that are uh, measured in the field or, or also with uh, uh, remotely sensed data are vertical attenuation coefficients, uh, reflectance, uh, there are also upwelling radiance uh, uh, or water living radiance or even remote sensitive reflectance. The one thing that I want to mention is that a change in the sea surface, a wave state, or even in the sun position changes the radiance distribution. And therefore, uh, the AOPs are affected, even though the IOPs remain unchanged. So there's a difference between both of them. Okay, we saw this uh, figure uh, last week, but as a reminder of uh, the, what we just mentioned about inherent optical properties and the color of water. When we talk about inherent optical, optical properties, like I mentioned, the two main ones are either absorption or uh, scattering. And absorption, uh, it's uh, governed by the presence of the different uh, constituents in the water column, such as phytoplankton, uh, sediment, the absorption of water itself and CDOM, uh, the coral dissolved organic matter. Whereas in the case of uh, scattering uh, by the different uh, suspended particles, scattering can be either in the forward direction or in the backward direction. And this depends on the size of the particle, on the even on the form of the particle. And I don't. Uh, um, and some other physical uh, properties of the particular matter that it's uh, that is suspended in the water. Also, I want to mention that uh, uh, that there's a there's a book uh, that it's uh, available online, so it's, it's free uh, by Kurt Mobley, who is pretty much one of the uh, I would say one of, one of the gurus of, of uh, of, uh, of uh, light and, and water color, uh, and, and particularly for, for the ocean. The, the book is called Ocean Optics, and it's freely available uh, online. Eventually, we can provide uh, uh, the link on it, of it uh, if, you can, if the uh, people are interested in the, during the Q&A session. Uh, 
Okay, let's talk about one particular uh, apparent optical property that is uh, widely used, which is the vertical attenuation coefficient. And the vertical attenuation coefficient, or KD uh, par, if we're referring to it in the photosynthetically active radiation, it's really one of the best optical parameters uh, that can be used uh, in terms of AOPs to characterize different uh, water bodies, uh, particularly in relation to the availability of uh, photosynthetically active radiation. And uh, um, this, is a, this is a simple equation that shows uh, the penetration of irradiance in the water column. Uh, it's uh, uh, calculated uh, by the e, e sub O is the irradiance at the at the water surface, and E sub C is the irradiance at any given depth. And KD is calculated as, as the slope of the uh, natural logarithm of uh, of ED or EZ, and uh, by measuring the downwelling irradiance at two different depths. So usually. Uh, with uh, with different uh, in situ instrumentation that we're gonna that we're gonna see in the in the next uh, slide, you calculate the irradiance at two different depths and then you use this simple equation to calculate the the KD. And this is some data that I uh, collected some years ago in areas is to compare areas that are more open ocean right at the shelf edge uh, where there's pretty much a blue light versus uh, in a shallow outer area in a reef. And you see here how light penetrates. This is uh, both uh, in the visible and also in the UV radiation, uh, particularly UVA. And you see how it penetrates in, in open ocean, uh, more than uh, 20 meters of water. Whereas in, 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 in areas that are close to the shoreline, you see how uh, the, the, the big difference in the light penetration, even in the first meter of water. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about some uh, typical field instrumentation for water quality characterization. Uh, usually when, when, when uh, measuring CDOM or total suspended matter or chlorophyll, uh, you collect water samples uh, at the surface or sometimes at different depths, and then uh, you do the, the chemical analysis for all these different parameters. Also, there's a, a number of different uh, profiling packages that, you, that that can be used, uh, usually called uh, optical rosettes, uh, as a common name. And these usually include a number of different instruments like a CD, CTD, uh, conductivity, te uh, temperature, and density uh, uh, measure, and a fluorometer, and even uh, other, other uh, instrumentations that AC9 for absorption and attenuation. And in this case, it has an instrument that it's particularly aimed at characterizing backscattering from uh, suspended matter. The, uh, the spectrohadiometers, such as the GER 1500 here, measures the radiance and irradiance at the water surface and then at the sky and to calculate the remote sensitive reflectance. And the, here's another instrument that is widely used in the uh, ocean color community, the, the HyperPro which is uh, another uh, spectrohadiometer, but in this case, this one is lowered at different depths to calculate the vertical attenuation coefficient. Now the graph here uh, shows the magnitude of absorption of different components, including water. And I want you to pay a close attention to water in, uh, in particular, uh, for example, uh, and see how it is actually several orders of magnitude, the absorption higher in the red compared to any of the other uh, wavelengths here. And it shows the, the, the really high absorption of, of, of light uh, the, by just by the pure water, in, uh, uh, in, particularly in the uh, longer wavelengths. Whereas in the in case of the green curve, uh, here shows the typical absorption of, of, uh, of phytoplankton with the characteristic peaks in the blue here and in the red. And the widening of the curve here, particularly with, uh, around the 450 to 500 nanometers region, is also indicative of the absorption of ancillary pigments, such as carotenes or even xanthophylls. 
As for gelp stuff or uh, colloid dissolved organic matter, it absorbs strongly in the blue and much less in the yellow red region of the spectrum. Now, this is also why CDOM, CDOM is known, usually known as yellow substance. Now, similarly to uh, gelp stuff, gelp stuff uh, suspended solids have a strong absorption in the blue and a strong reflectance in the yellow and the red and even in the near infrared, as it is shown here on this graph. Of course, this depends on the type of sediments, whether it's terrigenous, calcareous, or organic, the concentration of sediments, and the grain sizes. And the latter uh, mostly influences the scattering of light, as I mentioned before. The, this graph here also shows how the concentration of sediments greatly affects the reflectance in the visible and the infrared as it increases the, uh, with concentration. Check also how uh, blue waters barely reflect anything uh, in, the, in, the, in the red here, in the red region, um, the near infrared red region, because it's absorbed by the, by the water itself. And the the uh, the image here is, uh, is showing uh, a river plume from the Añasco River in West Puerto Rico, uh, just after a rain event, and it shows how uh, the sediment concentration, in particular, affects the color of coastal waters in this area. Now, Hurricane Sandy which was also unofficially referred to as Superstorm Sandy, was the deadliest and most destructive hurricane of the 2012 uh, Atlantic hurricane season. It caused more than $70 billion in damages and killed about 230 people in, different, in eight different countries. Sandy, Sandy also caused uh, major damage in the New York, New Jersey area. And here you can see two bears images uh, from one week before Sandy, and then a couple of days after uh, Sandy, and in particularly in the in the northeast coast of the U.S., and it shows uh, the extent of the reduction in light intensity here, as uh, measured by KD. And uh, about one month or a few weeks after the the, the hurricane, still there was there's a there's a pretty big uh, attenuation in the water column caused by the amount of sediments that were drawn into the coastal waters uh, as a as a result of Sandy. Now, chlorophyll A in particular is a classic indicator of primary production in the ocean and the coastal zone. It is the main pigment of most photosynthetic organisms from, from microscopic to higher plants. And its concentration varies and it's controlled to some extent by the amount of nutrients present in the water column. In clear reef water, for example, chlorophyll concentrations do not usually go beyond a couple of milligrams per cubic meter. Whereas in highly productive areas, just as the one, as the one shown here in Monterrey Bay, California, uh, can, can, can have uh, concentrations of more than 10 milligrams. Uh, per cubic meter. Here's uh, an image also sh uh, that shows the concentration in milligrams per cubic meters. Areas influenced by upwelling events may even have higher concentrations of chlorophylls also. Now, CDOM, or coral dissolved organic matter, is the optically active part of uh, DOM, of dissolved organic matter. CDOM, as I, as I said in the previous slides, it's also known as yellow substance, or also known as a chromophoric dissolved organic matter or gelp stuff. And it, uh, CDOM occurs naturally, but can increase due to the runoff or uh, river runoff, or as a result of uh, extreme weather events such as hurricanes. As a, as a, a constituent in the water column, it reduces the availability, availability of light, particularly in the blue region of, this, of the spectrum. And uh, usually in remote sensing, there, uh, people use band combinations in the blue and in the, in the red to quantify uh, CDOM. In, uh, particularly the new coastal band in, in, in Landsat 8, uh, which is the one shown here as band uh, one, has proven to be useful uh, for the detection of CDOM. 
here uh, what this graph shows is the different bands for uh, in, in red for uh, Landsat uh, 8 and also in one for the previous Landsat missions. Uh, I mean, in, in black for the previous Landsat missions, and you see uh, here how they differ. And you see the how the 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 the, the concentration of uh, CDM in particular uh, is uh, uh, reduced. Uh, the effects is, re is reduced in the particularly in the red region of the spectrum. Okay, now as I said, uh, we're gonna put this into a context of a shallow uh, coastal ecosystem. And uh, in this case, we're, we're concentrating uh, for the rest of the talk about, about coral reefs in particular. Uh, there, there are two main methods for monitoring shallow coastal ecosystems. You can, you can uh, monitor them directly, meaning that the, the ecosystem itself is the target uh, uh, for the analysis. And usually direct methods uh, address benthic properties, uh, geomorphological features, depending on the type of analysis that you do, uh, habitat complexity and others. But you can also use indirect methods, uh, which are more focused on oceanic or even uh, the atmospheric environment that surrounds the reef. So for instance, in the case of coral reefs, sea surface temperature uh, have been uh, related uh, with uh, particularly with uh, coral bleaching events or extreme events. This is uh, here in the, in, the, in the bottom right, here's a uh, uh, data from the NOAA Coral Reef Watch Program that monitors the sea surface temperatures uh, around the world on a pretty much on a daily basis. And it relates that to what would be what they call levels one or two or even warning or watch depending on 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 the amount of uh, cis, uh, the sea surface temperature, uh, what would be the potential for color bleaching in all those areas? Low salinities uh, can also be measured, and uh, and and high turbidity, particularly for uh, episodic uh, rainfall event, events. But unfortunately, in the in the case of uh, salinity, there's not that many uh, satellite-based sensors out there that measure salinity. One of them that I want to mention is the Aquarius uh, sensor from the Argentinian Space Agency, the Comisión Nacional de Actividades Espaciales, or CONOAE. And uh, but the, the disadvantage that it has, it has a, that it has, that it has a spatial resolution of about one degree, so that's about 150 kilometers. So it's only uh, actually useful for open waters, uh, not so much for coastal waters. Other uh, indirect uh, measures for uh, monitoring shallow coastal ecosystems include uh, measurement of uh, inherent and apparent optical properties, uh, all the different constituents in the water column, and also uh, you can relate solar insulation, UV radiation, for instance, and penetration in the water column with the health of some of these ecosystems. Now, the assessment of coral reef uh, uh, biodiversity using uh, remote sensing for that, first we need to def uh, define what it's uh, biodiversity, right? And biodiversity refers to the abundance, variety, and genetic constitution of uh, natural living uh, communities. It is also defined as the sum of all uh, biotic variation from the level, uh, from the gene level to the ecosystem level. And uh, it's uh, to ad address the spatial and temporal patterns in biological biodiversity, uh, biological diversity and richness. Uh, you need different ses sets of data. Um, for instance, uh, event, extreme events such as bleaching may result locally in the loss of biodiversity because of the death of a lot of uh, uh, coral colonies. Now, in terms of remote sensing, we need to define uh, relevant environmental proxies that can indirectly reflect species, species richness uh, patterns and other patterns. And for example, one of the measures that I typically use is KD uh, in the photosynthetically active radiation to estimate percent cover of living corals and species. And, uh, and eventually in the next uh, few slides, we're gonna see one example of the use of PART to estimate percent coral cover. Now let's talk a little bit about direct monitoring of benthic ecosystems. So traditionally, pixel-based classifications use uh, the differences in the spectral 
uh, signatures uh, be, um, to discriminate between different benthic features. Now, the uh, thing is that this requires the availability of a very robust spectral library of benthic components. And it's limited by the by the spectral and spatial resolution of the of the sensors. The last decade or so, other methods such as uh, object-based image analysis have been used to uh, to analyze uh, coral reef uh, ecosystems in particular and other other uh, coastal ecosystems. Um, uh, OVIA, in what it does is that it incorporates not only the uh, spectral signature or the spectral features of the different components, but it also incorporates data on the texture and even the shape or the location or particular uh, benthic components. So it allows for uh, for a definition of particularly uh, geomorphological classes. And what, what we're seeing here is a, an image uh, that was provided by the group of the uh, Living Ocean Foundations. Uh, this is an image from uh, Peros Vanos, which is an atoll in the Indian Ocean, and that was uh, the Living Ocean Foundation's team, uh, uh, managed by or led by Dr. Sam Perkis and Dr. Al Gleason. They what they did is that they used uh, OBIA to characterize this image in terms of geomorphological features, and this was the result of the characterization. So they characterized the whole reef in about 24 different uh, geomorphological classes. So you see the you see here the uh, the whole characterization uh, provided by by OBIA, which maybe would have not been possible if with traditional pixel-based uh, classifications. Now, for particularly for validating uh, satellite or airborne images, uh, as I mentioned, we need a, a we need a, a pretty big spectral library. If, 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 and and even, um, I'm more I'm more likely if we are working with uh, ecosystems that are highly heterogeneous, so, so, such as coral reefs and, and kelps. And one of the one of the main uh, ways of doing it is to pretty much bring a spectral heliometer on the water and collect spectral data on the different uh, benthic components. These are some photos of uh, actually myself uh, collecting data in some of, some reefs in the Caribbean. And uh, um, one of the advantages of collecting this type of in situ data is that uh, it not only collects, uh, it cannot only be used for validating satellite images, but it can also provide for a non-invasive tool to assess the health of benthic uh, organisms based on the on the spectral signal. And uh, particularly for uh, extreme events such as coral bleaching or even disease outbreaks, this could prove uh, a very useful tool to uh, follow those types of events. Here's some data that I've collected over the years uh, for some uh, Caribbean coral species. And it shows how difficult it actually is to, to separate the different species just based on the spectral signal, which is pretty much same that it's based on the, on the different colors. And you see here the, on the graph, what, what they show here, it's the, the in blue is the average, and then you have the, the standard deviations from the number of, uh, of uh, samples that I that I collected, you see that they look really, really similar, uh, particularly in the shape of the spectrum uh, form. So there's uh, there's uh, not much differenti differentiation that can be done just looking at the at the color. There's been some other uh, studies that are consider not only the color but also uh, the the different form and the texture of the coral colonies and to try to separate the species uh, combining all those different components. What we can do actually with uh, with uh, only the spectral signal is that, as I mentioned uh, before, we can follow coral bleaching events. And here's, a, here's a, a, some data that I also collected, have collected uh, where it shows the spectral signal of a normal coral shown here, uh, in this case is a, uh, so the Diploria clivosa, which is a brain coral from the Caribbean. Here's the the actual the typical color of this particular species in the in the top right, and how it looks in the when it's bleached here in the in the bottom uh, photo. And you see the spectral signal when it's bleached, and which is completely different from the normal or healthy in quotes 
uh, uh, coral colony. And this is because what you what we're seeing here is pretty much the skeleton of the coral because uh, the, uh, the, the, the coral tissue itself is pretty much transparent. Okay, I mentioned that you can do indirect monitoring of benthic ecosystems, and, uh, and particularly with KD. And KD uh, can be used to estimate different ecological indicators, so that's such as uh, percent co cover of uh, dominant groups or uh, percent uh, cover of, of corals in general. And, uh, and for coral reefs, uh, light attenuation, particularly due to high sediment concentrations, is inversely proportional to the hard coral cover. But it's directly proportional to percent macroalgal uh, coral cover. So the, the use of KD can also be uh, uh, one of those factors uh, that can be used uh, to uh, to follow the uh, phase shifts in this in these uh, ecosystems from coral to macroalgae. Uh, similarly, increases in system for temperature are correlated with a coral bleaching event, like I said, and even UV radiation has also been uh, directly correlated with a reduction in coral growth and reproduction. And the graph that we're seeing here is a graph from a master's thesis from the University of Puerto Rico, uh, and uh, it shows the direct relationship between KD here and percent coral cover in, in data collected in 17 different reefs around the island. It shows a pretty high correlation between these two parameters. Now, of course, there are limitations for satellite imagery, for uh, particularly for complex, complex uh, coastal ecosystems, and uh, mostly it's in terms of the of uh, the spatial resolution. Here's uh, images from uh, different sensors from spot, a 20 meter resolution. You can see you can barely, uh, it's really blurry, and you can barely uh, uh, differentiate between some of the different uh, components. Here's an image from CASI that was uh, that has a much higher uh, uh, spatial resolution, about five meters. You, you start seeing some of the benthic features, and and here's with the uh, with Iconos at one meter resolution, the same reef, and you see that now you can see some of the more uh, some some of the some of the uh, typical uh, components of of this particular area, uh, sandy areas, seagrass beds, uh, some of the corals. Uh, here and even mangrove forest in this case. Uh, even there's a, there's even a beach here that you can that you can see. Now, usually, also satellite imagery is uh, limited in uh, for coastal uh, ecosystems, uh, particularly for the first. It's limited uh, for the first ten uh, tens of meters of depth. And uh, and here's what you see that even in clear waters, such as here in La Palguera, the La Palguera Natural Reserve in Puerto Rico, you can use it to to very shallow uh, systems. Once you go beyond 10 or 20 meters of depth, you can barely see or distinguish any of the features uh, there. This is why for deeper communities, other methods are used, such as side scan or multi-beam sonars, or even the uh, uh, underwater autonomous vehicles have been used to pretty much map and with uh, underwater photography, uh, uh, mesophotic reefs or reefs that are uh, below 50 or 60 meters of depth. Here's a, a, an almost atmospherically almost corrected uh, average image. Uh, so it's a hyperspectral image of the reef that, that I just showed before uh, when I compared the the different uh, spatial resolutions, and what I, what I want to show is, what I, I want to show here is that even though this image is uh, atmospherically corrected, for instance, uh, I want to I want you to pay attention to let's say a couple of these uh, uh, curves. Here you can barely you you can you can definitely can't see say for certain that with this uh, spectral curve that this is coral. And even when you compare sandy areas with seagrass beds, also although they are pretty much different, right, to the to the eye, you see that the spectral signal is really, really, really similar here, because this image it's only has only been corrected atmospherically. It hasn't been it hasn't gone through the water column correction. For that, a team at the Bioptical Oceanography Lab uh, they did this exercise a few years ago where they located uh, a number of different tarps uh, underwater, uh, particularly black and, um, and white tarps underwater in the sandy areas in, in particular, because it's topographically, this is 
pretty homogeneous. And they collected uh, spectral data from these tarps. And then uh, here's uh, some of the data they collected. And you can see that it's pretty uh, homogeneous, the, uh, the, 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 the spectral signal here from the blue to the red. Uh, in, uh, in both in the white tarps and also in the in the black ones, and then they use this information to uh, to do the water column correction for the image the image that I just showed. And here's the uh, some of the uh, results that uh, show that, for instance, for the for average in particular, which by the way, of course, is hyperspectral, it agreed uh, within ten percent particularly for in between 400 and 600 nanometers and a little bit less in the in the red uh, also uh, mostly because still the the absorption of water itself is, is pretty big in, in in that area and uh but you can see some of the uh, spectral features are preserved here's uh data for instance for the uh sandy area I collected the red there's the data collected in the field and the the and the black is the corrected uh, uh, spectral signal from average. And you can see that some of the features are still preserved. Like I said, there's some, there's a, the big differences here in the, uh, in the red, but uh, some of the absorption features, like the ones that, the one of, uh, of chlorophyll around 675 nanometers is still preserved pretty well. And the reason why we're seeing uh, this uh, influence of chlorophyll here is that even though these are uh, sandy areas, there's still some uh, photosynthetic components in the, in the microbial components uh, between the, the sandy sediments. And this is, this is why we see this absorption of, of chlorophyll here. We're not looking at, uh, at, at a sandy area that is completely uh, pure, but it's actually a mix of sediments and uh, microbial components. Here's again the uh, before the water column correction in the same image. Like uh, this is uh, the same the same slide that I showed you before. And here is uh, the difference once it was uh, corrected for uh, for water for water column in particular. You see that for instance, if I go back again, the coral signal, how it looked here, versus how it looks now after the water column correction. You see that it's actually relatively similar to what it's collected in the field. And uh, particularly for the sandy area, which is the one that I showed in the previous slide, it's really, really similar uh, here. Same thing for the for seagrasses. And it's not perfectly uh, similar because of the differences in the, in the spectral resolution between the, the in-situ sensor and the uh, average sensor. And, and still, uh, remember this was a, an exercise to correct for the water column. But like I said, uh, the uh, water column is pretty much changing almost on a on a constant basis. So in summary, uh, the presence of a land derivative uh, suspended or dissolved constituents in coastal waters makes it difficult uh, uh, to use remote sensing data to study uh, shallow to moderate depth uh, ecosystems. But the color of water does provide a lot of information on the composition of, of these materials uh, in the water column. And most of the time, field data is actually necessary to validate the, the spectral information from the, from the sensor. So even in clear, really clear coastal waters, such as uh, the ones, uh, those uh, found in, in the tropic, for instance, light attenuation still occurs very fast in the water column, as we just saw in the, in the, in the last slides. And obtaining information for, for benthic uh, ecosystems is particularly challenging. All right, so next uh, week, we're gonna talk a little bit about the remote sensing of shorelines. We're gonna do an overview of the uh, different types of uh, shorelines, particularly concentrating in beaches and, and other similar areas. And then we'll talk about uh, remote sensing and in-situ techniques that can be used to study shoreline changes at different scales. So remember that you may contact myself or Amber McCollum uh, on the uh, on the uh, emails that are shown on the screen. But if you have uh, particular questions uh, regarding the RSET program uh, in general, you can also contact our program manager, uh, Dr. Ana Prados. 
And you can find out also more information on the ARSEM website about different other different type of trainings that are available. So thank you very much for your attention. We're going to take some questions now, so feel free to write them down in the in the chat. And we're going to try to answer some of them now, and the rest of them will be answered in during the in the Q and A document uh, eventually. That's going to become available on the website by the end of this week. So thank you very much, and let's go to the Q and A. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar again. It's, uh, it's probably a record breaking. Uh, we had a, a more than 1,200 participants during this uh, English session. So thank you all for, for attending and spreading the word. All right, uh, can you make it a little bit bigger, Brock, so that I can uh, see it? Uh, there it is, okay. All right, let's 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 uh like I said uh like I said I'm gonna we're gonna uh answer some of the questions some of the questions the ones that we can't answer just because of time uh today we'll make sure to answer them on the uh Q and A document that it's gonna become available on the website uh most likely uh, towards the end of this week uh or even or even before okay uh first the so the first question are there any there are unmanned systems for cold star remote sensing uh yes there's a number of commercial drones are available they have being applied to coastal systems well terrestrial terrestrial and coastal systems um from you know the very basics uh phantom type type drones which are relatively cheap uh will have a high resolution camera on them uh, to bigger drones that uh, fly other instruments, such as there's a number of uh, different multi-spectral cameras uh, available, and uh, and on these days also there's been uh, the development uh, very recently on or on hyperspectral cameras uh, as well. So like I said last week, uh, this uh, one of the questions last week I, I believe it was or or I covered it in session one. Uh, this would bring the uh, the advantage of having both. Uh, the, the uh, high spectral resolution, but also high spatial resolution, and particularly for coastal ecosystems, at least my opinion is that it, it would be really useful. Uh, there's still a lot to do in this field, definitely. And, uh, and by the way, NASA, the airborne, uh, our airborne facility has a number of different uh, UASs on my aerial uh, systems that have been used mostly for terrestrial systems, but uh, definitely can also be applied to coastal uh, systems as well. Okay, um, question number two, in which, uh, uh, how deep can this instrument work? I believe it was referring to the, the question came early uh, uh, during the webinar, I think it was referring to the, the instrument that I showed uh, in the first uh, slides. That is uh, an optical package that uh, that is usually submerged from a boat uh, and you can with use it in, in oceanic water. So, so we, we have a, we have submerged um, that or that particular package or the similar ones to hundreds of meters of depth, so it's it's really robust. And uh, the advantage of it is that you can pretty much uh, put a, a number of different instruments on it depending on, on what you want to characterize. And uh, and for instance, in this case, we had uh, uh, instruments related to uh, backscattering of war, of uh, uh, constituents also to measure uh, water temperature, salinity, and uh, absorption of, uh, uh, of uh, light, and other uh, different parameters. So it, it depends, it's usually, it depends on the, on, on what is the, uh, the, the study that you guys, the audit that the researcher is conducting. What are the different questions that you wanna uh, answer uh, with that data? Um, is there a relationship between uh, sediment and chlorophyll, not necessarily. Uh, those are two different water column constituents. Uh, but having said that, I can I can uh, honestly say that uh, increases in chlorophyll uh, usually also accompanied by increases in sediment, particularly in areas where there's a river influence. And the thing is that with rivers, usually when, whenever there's a river, river runoff, there's uh, there's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of nutrients uh, washing. Uh, from the from the upper parts of the watershed into the the coastal areas, and with those nutrients, uh, you, uh, you, that, that brings an increase in phytoplankton, for instance, and therefore you know, chlorophyll. A. So, 
so yes, in, in that sense, uh, it, it depends from from the on the, uh, the let's say from from when, where they originate from. There were a lot of people. Question number four. There was, there was a lot of people actually, actually asking about the uh, Kurt Mobley's uh, book. I included here the 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 link to to that, and uh, and to some of them, we also in the chat we we uh, uh, included the link uh, as well. Yeah, uh, Kurt Mobley is one of the definitely one of the authorities, the world renowned authorities on uh on uh bioptical oceanography uh, definitely and uh and originally the, this book was available on a you know on a printed copy but then he made it available also for just pretty much for everyone in the on the planet right uh, uh through this uh, website and it's really really uh it's a book that it's a uh, it, uh, it goes from the very basics of of defining some of the just the major characteristics of a of uh, the of the water light penetration in the water to the more advanced um, the more advanced uh, details on on equations and how to do calculations and everything. So it's a really 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 good book, and I definitely recommend it. And I, I noticed that uh, our my colleague uh, here uh, Selwyn included the the link also in the uh, in the chat as well uh, to make it available for 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 the our participants. So thanks, Selwyn. Okay, uh, is KD an aquatic analog to aerosol optical depth? You know, I had not thought of that in that term before, but it, indeed, I think it can be even it can be considered an analog, an analog in the sense that uh, both parameters they they depend on the amount of particles that are suspended either in the water or in the atmosphere. So yeah, that's that's a nice way of seeing it. Um, okay, uh, number six. In case of remote sensing data, is it possible to measure AOPs, apparent optical properties, by optimizing or reducing the environmental effects? So not really. Uh, you can definitely reduce some of them, like for instance, a vertical attenuation coefficient, uh, by reducing the amount of the water, constitu water column constituents. So in, the, in this case, you know, making the water clearer. Uh, that's what, what I mean uh, by it. And uh, because remember that, for, for instance, KD, what it does, what it gives you is um, is uh, an estimate of the transparency of the water. So uh, obviously the clearer the water, the lower the, the, the KD and, and vice versa. The, 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 the more turbid the water, the higher the KD. But uh, but it's not really you're not really uh, measuring AOP by re by reducing the environmental effects. It's just you're using the AOPs to estimate what are what uh, what's the the condition of the water column. <clears throat> okay, uh, number seven. <laughs> Excuse me. Is it difficult to determine live versus dead coral? And if so, then why? It's not difficult. Uh, I've been working with coral reefs almost my whole life. And, uh, and usually live corals uh, are uh, typically characterized by their brilliant colors, right? The yellows to the reds to other colors, even sometimes even, even uh, purple or, or green. Uh, depending on, and this depends on a number of factors, but uh, mostly on uh, on the on the, the presence of the uh, sosantelli and the different pigments inside of the corals. And the corals also have some some sort of uh, uh, pigments uh, as well, uh, like uh, for instance, uh, green fluorescent proteins. Um, so the so when the let's talk a little bit first about coral bleaching before getting into dead coral. So when corals bleach, they they look white because they're loose, they, they pretty much lost their either the sosantelli or they lost their pig their photos, the sosantelli lost their photosynthetic pigments, or it might be a combination of both. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then usually from this step it's it's usually everything is downhill. Uh, unless the, there's a there's a, a a recovery in the in the in the water column in terms of the of, of how how of, of how it it gets and and the coral kind of you know gets gets to breathe again so so it gets to live but uh, but usually when when corals breach uh, 
if they die, then the dead coral itself, uh, and by the way, when corals beach, you look at them, you, they see they look white because what you're seeing are is just the, pretty much coral, the coral skeleton. Most of the most of the uh, coral tissue is actually transparent. Um, so when they die, they're usually very rapidly colonized by other organisms that are opportunistic organisms, such as filamentous or turf algae, or even cyanobacteria. I've seen coral colonies uh, uh, that are literally centennial coral colonies of hundreds of years, and I've seen them after a bleaching event being covered in, with cyanobacteria in a matter of a month or two. Okay, uh, what's the difference between TSS, total suspended solids, or total suspended sediments, and CDOM? Uh -huh. And then this is uh, measuring the same thing. So I covered uh, this in session one to, to, to some extent, uh, and we've covered it in, in some other uh, webinars, like the Freshwater uh, Ecosystems webinar that we, we gave last year. And uh, in general, uh, TSS, total suspended solids or total suspended sediments, is uh, related exclusively to suspended particles in the water, whereas CDOM is the optically active part of the dissolved organic matter. So those are two different things. CDOM, CDOM is dissolved in the water column, TSS are suspended, okay? Uh, so there are two different parameters that affect light penetration in, in, in the water column. So they, yeah, no, they're not measuring the same thing. Okay, uh, question number nine says, so rivers tend to be carrying high sediment plume. High sediment plume, is it a global event or local? That's a good question. Uh, usually, uh, I would say yes, uh, but it depends on the, it actually depends on the characteristic of the watershed that is associated with that particular rivering system. And uh, um, definitely it, uh, it depends on the land uses that have happened uh, over the years within that watershed, whether there's been, let's say, a clearance of, of vegetation in the area. And obviously that will bring more uh, so more sediments to the to the coastal areas because there's not the the root system that can contain them right uh, from from the from, from from the vegetation from the from the plants uh, so it, it may also depend on whether uh, the river is channelized or not and then so usually when the rivers are channelized uh, they there's there's a there's a pretty much a clear path for the sediments to to eventually get to the coastal areas. Uh, there. It depends on the steepness of the watershed. Uh, the person whether they're the, in, in the watershed is more dominated by paved or non-paved roads. That, that obviously depend on the country, on the or just the, the the area where the watershed is, is at. And uh, so yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's a matter of uh, of uh, and, and those are a few examples of a uh, number of different uh, parameters that are that are that. That are the influence on whether the sediments, the the river mouth, are carrying high amounts of sediments or not. Can you identify number ten? Can you identify the remote sensing particles uh, of trash based on thickness of that product? So, like plastic. Okay, stay tuned because session three of this webinar is uh, I'll cover some of that by the uh, towards the end of the session on session three on uh, marine debris uh, in particular i can 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 you go up a little bit uh but i want to see the the uh there was something in the, in the question yeah thanks okay uh based on the thickness of the product i don't know if you can what i can what i can what i can tell you though uh so far is that i don't know if you can you can uh, identify based on the thickness of the product but as, as you'll see in session three it may depend on whether, for instance, whether, uh, particularly if you're collecting data in situ, it may depend on whether you are uh, uh, you are uh, looking at the upper, uh, let's say the the yeah the the upper part or the lower part of the of the plastic or, or uh, whether the, uh, but I, by that I mean the part that is actually facing the the sun or the part that it's uh, is, is facing the the water. Usually, uh, the one that's facing the sun is affected by UV radiation and other other uh, things, and uh, uh, and that affects the spectral uh, signature of, of of the of the trash. So yeah, we'll 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 talk a little bit about that uh, next week.
uh, also. All right, what is the spatial resolution and temporal resolution of the data available? That obviously depends on the satellite or the sensor. So uh, I just gave a couple of examples, but there's so many, uh, so many uh, uh, satellites or sensors out there. Um, for, uh, for instance, La Landsat data has a 30 meter spatial resolution for the uh, single bands and, and the 16 day revisit time. MODIS has a coarser resolution, 250 meters to, to a one kilometer, but the data is daily. Uh, uh, mostly uh, daily bears is similar uh, to MODIS uh, also, so it depends on the it depends on the on the uh, sensor and the satellite. And uh, and I and I believe we covered uh, most of this also in, in a number of different web access webinars, but definitely on the fundamentals to remote sensing uh, webinar. Okay, uh, twelve. Why do different corals differ, uh, have different uh, spectral signals? And is it because of the amount of Sosantelli one coral colony has? Yes. Uh, different uh, coral species have different Sosantelli clades. And there's uh, so far, I believe there's about 20, maybe even more, uh, 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 different Sosantelli clades subscribed to, the, to this state. And these vary uh, in terms of their concentration of different pigments and the, even the type of pigments. So some of the some of the work that I've done, some of the work that I presented in this webinar, um, our papers from 2012 and 2015 in particular, they uh, where we showed that, uh, for instance, in we in in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a coral colony, we were able to find about 20 different coral uh, pigments. So that gives you an idea of, of, of how many there are in there, right? And uh, and the signal depends on the on the structure, even on the structure of the coral skeleton. As in, internally, it may reflect differently depending on whether the coral has a more dense or a, or a lighter uh, skeleton. So yes, the, the the spectral signals depend on a number of factors, definitely on the amount of sosantelli, the amount of uh, pigments that they have, the concentration of pigments, and also on the type of skeleton that the coral has, actually. Okay, um, what would be the effect of a uh, rising sea surface temperature on the corals and the relatively cooler ocean basins, like the North Atlantic, for example. Do, do corals grow there? There's a number of coral species that grow there. These are what are usually known at, as a, as a, a Aestosantelli or Ahermatypic uh, corals. And I'll, I'll make sure that I that I that I put the uh, that particular wording in there uh, in the final document. But uh, but uh, corals in the in the northern waters, uh, in the colder waters, they are uh, very different from those in, in tropical areas. Uh, for instance, they don't have they usually don't have the sosantelli uh, inside of them, and they are whitish. Uh, most of them are actually white, uh, and uh, and it's just because of that they don't have the, the photosynthetic pigments inside and uh, and and they they're usually very slow growing so if corals in the tropics are grow on a really slow pace so pretty much uh, uh, but uh, on average let's say a centimeter a year uh, cold water corals grow even at a slower pace uh, be, most likely because they don't have that help from the sosantelli in terms of, of, of uh, metabolism. So uh, whether sea surface, increased sea surface temperature affects or not the uh, these uh, organisms, um, particularly if it's, um, uh, since they are adapted to to uh, colder waters, there's actually hasn't been that much research uh, on this topic. I'll, I'll do a search and see if I, if I can, if I find any, any particular paper that I find interesting that, that talks about this in particular, I'll make sure that I include the reference in the, uh, uh, in the final document. So it's, it's a really good question. Thanks. Okay. Is there any way by which we can measure bathymetry by observing the height of waves? Again, stay tuned. Next week, we're going to cover, uh, shoreline bathymetry and topography. And some of the methods that are, that people have used uh, to uh, to estimate uh, those two parameters, so shoreline topography and bathymetry, are going to be covered uh, 
uh, next week. So yeah, stay tuned for next week. Uh, there's a question on sea surface temperature. How deep is the surface? <laughs> okay, and can sea surface temperature represent the depth of where the coral exists? Yeah, usually when uh, where when the when different sensors, satellite sensors, for instance, uh, they when they measure sea surface temperature, it's literally that the surface uh, of the water. So the first uh, usually I would say at the most not not much the first centimeters of water. Uh, yeah, uh, but I can say this in regards to the to the second question, which is, can sea surface temperature represent the depth of where coral exists? <clears throat> it depends on 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 where on which depth. Um, in, in 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 usually based on my experience in the, in in tropical areas, the 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 water temperature doesn't change that much from. Uh, the surface to where coral lives, which is usually, let's say, I don't know, above 20 meters of depth or 20 to 40 meters of depth. Um, there might be a slight change in the uh, temperature, but usually a reduction in, in temperature with depth. Uh, it gets colder, um, but that also depends on the ocean currents, the water currents that are, that are you know, washing these uh, ecosystems, this, uh, all these, these organisms. Um, so yes, you can, you can, we usually use the surface temperature as a representative of the uh, temperature where, at where the, the, the coral exists, because they usually live in shallow waters. So anyway, it's not gonna change much, particularly in the tropics. Can KB uh, be used as well to characterize the small scale, uh, scale benthic components in the, in a complex structure communities, stromatolite, seagrass, sediment microalgae, and larger uh, agar patches? Well, what KB will, I, again, what KB will give you is a measure of the transparency of the water. So it's not really characterizing the the benthic uh, components. It's pretty much it's it's a way of characterizing the let's say the environment of where these uh, organisms live. Uh, in this case, in in the in terms of uh, light penetration in the water. Okay, uh, so it's it's applicable to any of those uh, any of those uh, 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 ecosystems that you're mentioning, uh, stromatolites, seagrasses, and, and others. But remember that what you're doing is characterizing the environment, not necessarily the the benthic components. You, because KD is a measure of water transparency, not a measure of uh, whether there's seagrass or coral or anything else down there. Okay, uh, can you can, could you share some sources that are used for uh, that use uh, underwater autonomous vehicles? Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I provide uh, some references in the in the final document. We um, we actually uh, actually my 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 major professor uh, Dr. Rory Armstrong. Uh, who, by the way, is going to be in the in the Spanish session uh, with us? But uh, uh, he's uh, he he led along with uh, with uh, with another colleague from the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. Uh, they led a number of projects in Puerto Rico and the USBI where uh, we used an underwater autonomous vehicle to characterize what are known as mesophotic reefs, which are reefs that usually live uh, below about 50 meters of water. And uh, we did a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, projects uh, there some years ago, and I'll make sure that I include the references uh, for, for the benefit of, of, of the person who, who, who asked the particular question. What are the different relevant environmental proxies that help in assessment of coral reef biodiversity using remote sensing? Hmm, okay, uh, so we covered some of this and in this webinar actually. Um, you, usually, you can do there's there, there's only so much that you can that you can uh, uh, do for discriminating benthic uh, communities, right? Because of, like I said in the presentation, because of the 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 the, the influence of the of the water column and the light penetration in the water column, so different environmental proxies that people usually use are 
uh, pretty much what I, the ones that I mentioned in the presentation, KV uh, is, is probably one of the main ones. Uh, so vertical attenuation coefficient, KD, the concentration of sediments to total suspended sediments, TSS, CDOM, uh, and then also uh, chlorophyll A, for instance, concentration of chlorophyll in the in the water column. And uh, so those are typical parameters because, again, what you're doing is describing the environment or, or where they live, and based on that, then you can somehow say whether, or you can you can somehow predict whether what is the what would be the the benthic environment that it's living uh, in those in, in doing on, on those conditions, right? So, for instance, uh, whether there's there's been there was a and I believe I I showed the the graph in one of the slides of a uh, of a uh, master students from the student from the University of Puerto Rico, and she did a, a beautiful beautiful thesis um, where she uh, uh, described uh, in detail uh, the relationship between KD and percent coral cover uh, in particular. And uh, we are actually in the process of, uh, of publishing that uh, also. So yeah, uh, uh, pretty much all the, all the, 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 the different, uh, the different, uh, uh, wow constituents of the, the IOPs and IOPs that I mentioned are, are used for, for, for assessment in coral reef biodiversity. Okay, can you uh, differentiate coral bleaching caused by increasing surface temperature from that one caused by eutrophication or disease or water pollution from remote sensing? No, you can't. Um, you can actually, Actually, unless uh, unless you have really high resolution, both high, high high spectral and high spatial resolution, you probably won't be able to set to differentiate much coral bleaching. If you have a coarse spatial resolution, it's really hard. Obviously, unless you the, the whole reef is is bleached. Um, so and uh, and then on top of that, yes, no, you can't. You can't. You, you're not going to know whether the, the bleaching event was caused. Uh, from system temperature or other parameter, if you're just looking at the, let's say, as at an image uh, from from that particular coral reef, if you have data, so system first temperature data or other data, you may be able to relate it. You can say, well, if this event happened, it, it correlates with the increases in in temperature from this particular you know time period or something. But uh, but other than that, no, it, you, you can't. How do you measure salinity with remote sensing? There's the, like I said in the in the webinar, there's very few uh, instruments out there that measure salinity. Mention one of them from the uh, from the uh, Argentinian Space Agency. Uh, that it's uh, it's available. <laughs> the problem is the spatial resolution. It's 100 kilo, 150 kilometers. Uh, the the uh, the pixel size. So it's 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 probably good for for ocean waters, not that good for coastal ones, uh, obviously. And uh, and someone in the in the chat actually mentioned another sensor that was just uh, uh, was just sent uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, out there to the you know, space. So so I'm gonna look into that one and see see if there's anything uh, if it's, if it's already producing some kind of data. What are some specific uh, recommended techniques and tools for water uh, column corrections. There's a number of different algorithms that have been uh, produced for water column correction. In particular, uh, I can provide some of the some of the uh, references for for them. There, most of them have been uh, based on on local data, collected in situ data. Uh, and like it's because mostly because, like I said in the presentation, um, the, the water column the, uh, can change in in, in any in any given place at any given time. So uh, uh, that that is why it's important to have in situ data, particularly for 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 validation of of, uh, of satellite imagery for 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 coastal waters. So yes, I'll I'll make sure that I include uh, some of them, some of the papers that have been uh, produced by. Uh, Chong Ming Hu and, um, and Bo Kai Gao in particular for uh, water column corrections. 
phytoplankton growth is correlated with the metal presence, yes, with iron in the ocean, how iron emissions affect the coastal uh, ecosystem. Can we identify iron in the oceans present through satellites? I don't know, I have to look into that, but I'm not sure if you can identify or you can do some sort of proxy for, for iron uh, with satellites. Um, yes, it's the the person is totally right. No, iron is one of the is is one of the factors that affect uh, phytoplankton growth. And obviously, as uh, 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 if if there's an increase in iron in the in the coastal system, obviously it's going to bring an, an increase in phytoplankton as well. So. Can you tell us more about the floating algal index? Uh, it's an index that was uh, the, it was uh, uh, defined by Chao Ming Hu, so Hu, H-U, uh, uh, some years ago. It was particularly for sargassum, for identifying sargassum, the sargassum uh, brown seaweed in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, which has been a, a nuisance for, for, for many years already. And uh, and it uses a couple of uh, two two different bands uh, uh, from Modis in particular to 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 follow uh, sargassum and uh, and I can pro I'll, I'll provide the the particular reference for it. There's actually there's there's even a, 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 a Chao Ming has a, a, a what is it a, a, he has a website that uh, where he uh, monthly he uploads the yeah, the uh, the uh, analyzed images from all this for for sargassum. So there is a, a sargassum index, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll also provide the link uh, to it if, if people are more uh, interested in sargassum in particular for for the for the tropics. Okay, maybe we can do a couple more. Um, let's see, slide thirty-two. Hmm. Ah, okay, the black and white tarp in situ readings for water column correction. How important is this step? Is there any method like a dark pixel subtraction? Yes, you can use dark pixel, pixel subtraction for uh, water column correction. You're totally right. Actually, that's what most people use. Um, this was an exercise that was conducted. The what I mentioned in that particular slide uh, that was conducted by the University of Puerto Rico. They wanted to see if they could use this, you know, simple, relatively simple methodology to extract the water column to do a water column correction, in particular in shallow waters, shallow coral reef waters. So it was a I don't know exactly the material of the of the tarp. Uh, it was some sort of plastic material. Pretty big, about the size of a pixel uh, from, from from average in that sense. So it was, uh, I think, it was something like four by four meters or something like that. Uh, each of the tarps, and they had black tarps and white tarps. And uh, so the idea was that you can you have a you have a white target and a dark target at the same time, and you can do the correction for both uh, in the water column. And then you apply that to the average images to uh, see if you can somehow correct for for water column effects and and as you saw in the in the slide they 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 did a pretty good job of, of particularly of correcting for for water column <laughs> so yeah it's a good uh, if you have a student it's a good uh, I would say master's thesis or something for for a student uh, to to play with that Okay. Um, uh, hyperspectral imagery sensors. Com uh, uh, hyperspectral imagery sensors compromise in spatial resolution, which leads to mixed pixel formation. Yes, the algorithm approach to correct for mixed pixels into pure pixels and any hyperspectral unmixing tool. Available for researchers to use retriever hyperspectral imagery. Yes, I believe there is, and I'll, I'll I'll look into some references and make sure that I put post some references references on this. Yeah, there's uh, particularly I would encourage the the uh, the person to look into the Coral uh, web page from from the, the the Coral the NASA funded Coral project. Which in, 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 the, in that case they used uh, hyperspectral imagery um, 
with the advantage of so it was it was a sensor the prism sensor for flowing in the in a in a in an airborne uh platform so it had a pretty good spatial resolution i think it was about seven seven meters or so um but yeah i'll 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 definitely post some 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 references uh for this for the benefit of this person okay and uh, the spectral calibration data need to correct the simultaneously with satellite imagery or can the in-situ data be used at different time um okay it can be used uh, if you if you don't have it at, at the you have data from different times but uh but like i said in the in the presentation definitely the the closer that you collect the data to, from the from the over from the satellite overpass the better because that way you are you make you're sure that that you're pretty much characterizing the same thing if you are if you if you collect the data at some other time or even sites then definitely a particular if, if it's a, a, a different site the water column is going to be most likely it's going to be very different from the from from the data that, that where you're using the, the satellite uh, you know imagery uh, to to do the mapping so yes definitely the recommendation is to collect the data either simultaneously with the satellite overpass or between a couple of uh, hours in, uh, you know plus or minus the, the the satellite overpass okay um let's see there's a, there's been a, a number of questions related to uh, are there any any models uh, related to nutrient sediment runoff uh, to the water body bodies or or any uh, uh, indices to 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 monitor uh, kelp. So uh, let's see. I'll I'll oh, yeah. I want to make sure that I that I post this question in the, in the Q and A and then uh, eventually I. I uh I answer it uh in the final document. So let me hold on a second and I'll uh okay. Okay, I got it. Um so I'll I'll make sure that the, for the person who's asking that particular question, I'll make sure that I include it in the PNA document. Okay, uh one more. How is runoff water related to changing ecology and how can we relate? This. So, how runoff is water to is uh, how runoff water is related to to uh, uh, ecology? Well, it will affect. Uh, but if we're talking about, let's say, benthic. Uh, oh, there's a question. Oh, perfect. Is is there is there if we're talking about uh, particularly tropical coral reefs, for example? Coral reefs are definitely affected by runoff, by sediment, um, by the the um, the amount of nutrients that usually come up with well, come get to the water with runoff. Okay. Um, the in, in in general terms, what happens is that the the higher than the concentration of, of uh, sediments in the water column, then the less uh, the penetration of light in the water column. So there's going to be less light for the sosantelli to do photosynthesis, and therefore it's going to be less light for uh, to, to uh, it's going to be it's going to be there's going to be less products for the coral to metabolize and to to even construct a coral skeleton, okay. Um, uh, in the same along the same lines, also sediment in the water column. Uh, uh, well, uh, once it gets deposited on on top of the corals, it, what it will do is that it will uh, it will uh, affect the the tissue of the coral. The coral corals have a very 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 delicate tissues. They look like uh, they look like rocks underwater, but they're not. Okay, and their tissues they're and they are particularly particularly uh, uh, delicate. Okay? Even if, uh, for instance, that's one one of the main reasons why we usually tell divers not to even touch the corals because when you're touching the coral, you're pretty much uh, removing some of the tissue of it. You're you're killing the coral. Same thing with the with the sediments. The sediments, the the abrasion caused by the sediments is is, is pretty hard on on, on corals. Uh, I had this when I had this my, uh, when I was teaching at the university. I used to tell my students that imagine if you if you have uh, if someone is uh, is start scratching your your hand with sandpaper, 
eventually you're going to bleed, right? So that's what's going to happen with the coras. They're not, they're not going to bleed because they don't have blood, but they're, they're going to lose the tissue. Uh, so same, same, same principle with sediments. Okay, the number, uh, I'll probably go to, um, to maybe this uh, couple more, 28 and 29. Are there any any good models to uh, models uh, nutrient sediment runoff uh, in the in the uh, water bodies? Yes, we we covered some of the models in the uh, I mean water bodies in general. We covered some of the models with in the in the freshwater uh, remote sensing of freshwater systems uh, webinar uh, last year and. Uh, and also, yes, for coastal or for oceanic waters, there's a number of uh, different models uh, for 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 measuring uh, uh, sediment runoff. Again, these are mostly has been, mostly been being constructed in situ with data, with in situ data, and and then use that data to validate uh, what the what we're seeing with the images. Um, so yeah, for 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 this person in particular, I'll I'll, I'll include some of the references uh, as well. And finally, how is the hyperpro profiling uh, spectral radiometer different from the GER? Okay, so the GER is a handheld uh, spectral radiometer. It's not uh, it's not to measure. Um, uh, it, it does. It's not used uh, kind of like a second part of this question. It's not used. The GER is not used to the to derive KD. GER um, is mostly used to derive a remote sensitive reflectance. Okay, uh, from the, as as a measure of of how the of, of the of the water color uh, itself, the HyperPro is actually one instrument that you can download. Uh, you can download. You can you can submerge in the water for for uh, to a certain depth, and then you can use it to construct uh, a KD curve in the in the water column. So those are two. Two different instruments. Okay, one of them is used. Gear is used for for remote sensing reflectance to 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 uh, to uh, have an idea of the remote sensing reflectance to to calculate the remote sensing reflectance. Hyperpro is used to 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 actually to get uh, vertical attenuation coefficients among other factors. Okay. So there's a number of other questions here. Uh, uh, again, I'll make sure that I answer all of them uh, thoroughly in the in the final final document. Again, I want to thank you all for participating in this session two of this webinar, and um, I want to thank the RCEP team as well for the assistance and support, and um, uh, definitely my colleague uh, Amber. Uh, from Ames, and uh, and then I uh, stay tuned for next week on session three when uh, we're going to be the final session. We'll be talking about the uh, remote sensing of shorelines in particular. Uh, we're going to cover shorelines, uh, different types of shorelines in general, also uh, bathymetry, like I said, and we're going to touch a little bit also at the end on uh, marine debris um, as well. And, uh, um, and yes, by by next week, by the end of next week, we will uh, uh, also post the homework in the in the in the website for you guys to uh, complete it. And remember that uh, after next week, you have two week, two more weeks until September twenty second to complete that homework and then to be able to get your certificate eventually uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, so thank you again, guys. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your day.